G'day guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to find the equations of motion for a two degree of freedom spring mass system. So this is our system just here. We've got one block here, we've got another block here. They're both of mass m, and these springs have spring stiffnesses both of k. Now I wanna give you a minor disclaimer. Usually in engineering vibrations, they prove this using linear algebra. What I'm going to do, because I've already done a video on that, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to prove this using just calculus. So no linear algebra and no matrices or determinants or anything like that, okay? So the first thing we need to do to get started with something like this is we need to draw the free body diagram of both of these masses. Let me actually draw the free body diagram of this first mass just here, and let's find the forces acting on it. Well, if this mass has moved a distance x1 from its equilibrium position, then that means that this spring will be exerting a force on it to the left, which will be kx1. Now, how do you find the forces on this mass from this spring? Well, there's a few ways to do it, but my personal preferred method is to first imagine what happens when this mass moves a distance x2 and this mass remains stationary. If that's the case, then this spring will be, will be stretched out, meaning it'll be pulling on this mass in this direction. And this will be kx2 just here. And then what you do is then you consider what happens when this mass is moving, but this mass is remaining still. So if that's the case, then the spring will be being compressed, meaning that it'll be pushing back on this mass with a force of kx1. This is my preferred method to thinking about the forces on this block, but of course you can also do this by relative motion if you prefer. And now let's consider the free body diagram on this mass just here. Well, we can just use the fact that it's gonna be equal and opposite forces, but let's apply the same method just to ensure we're right. Well, if you first imagine that this block is moving away with a distance x2 while keeping this one still, that means this string will be under tension, meaning that it'll be pulling it back with a force kx2 like this. And then if you imagine that this block is moving, but this one is still, that means the spring will be being compressed, meaning that it'll be pushing this block away with a force kx1 like that. Notice that these forces right here are equal and opposite. So that's another way we could have approached that. All right, now that we've got the free body diagram sorted, let's use F equals MA to generate some equations. We know for the first block that the sum of forces is equal to MA. And so what are the sum of forces? Well, you've got this force just here, which is kx2, and then you've got to minus it from these forces, which group together to form minus two kx1. And that's gonna be equal to your mass of this block times by the acceleration of that block, which is x1 double dot. Now let's apply F equals ma to this block just here. We know that the sum of forces is equal to ma, which means that we've got Let's see, it'll be kx1 um, minus kx2 is going to be equal to mx2 double dot. And so interestingly, what we've got here is we've got two very different expressions, which I'll call equation one and equation two, which we need to solve. Now, usually what you do is you'd plug this into a matrix and go through the whole process. But I want to avoid using linear algebra. So how do we do this? Well, what we need to do is we need to make x2 the subject from this expression. So x2 is going to be equal to m on k x1 double dot plus two um, x1. That's what happens when you divide the k through and solve for x2. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to differentiate this expression with respect to time twice, right? And you might be a little bit confused why I'm doing that, but bear with me, it'll, it'll become clear shortly. If we differentiate twice, then we're left with x2 double dot is going to be equal to m on k x1 quadruple dot, so the fourth derivative, plus 2x1 double dot like this. And so what's important about doing this is this means we can substitute out the values of x2 from this second equation just here and have an equation just involving x1. So let's do that. What happens? Well, we're gonna have kx1 here, and then we're gonna subtract that from k times by x2, where x2 is just this beast, m on k x1 double dot plus two x1 like that. And that's gonna be equal to m times by x2 double dot, which is m on k x1 dot 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 
um, plus 2x1 double dot, like that. And so what we've got now is we've got an expression just involving x1, which is brilliant. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tidy this up a little bit and see where we get. Well, if we bring everything to the right-hand side, we're going to get um, m squared on k x1 dot 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 dot. Um, let's bring both of these guys over. That's 2 um, plus 1, so that's plus 3 um, m uh, x1 double dot. And then when you group these together, you're going to get um, minus kx1. Bring it over there. It's going to become plus kx1. And that's going to be equal to 0 just there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply k through um, on both sides. That means that m squared times x1 dot 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 plus 3k m x1 double dot plus k squared x1 is going to be equal to 0. And so interestingly, this shows that we need to solve a fourth order linear differential equation to find the equation of motion for x1. That's what this means. Well, we know how to solve an equation like this. All we need to do is we need to guess a value of x1. And I'm going to guess x1 is in the form of e to the j omega t. Right? I'm going to assume x1 is in this form, and I'm going to see what happens when I plug it in here. Now, in order to plug this value of x1 into here, we need to find expressions for x1 quadruple dot and x1 double dot. So let's do that by differentiating this guy twice. What will we get? We'll have minus omega squared e to the j omega t, and x1 dot 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 is going to be equal to um, omega to the 4 e to the j omega t. Now, if you were to plug these values into here and then divide by the ej omega t, you'd be left with your characteristic equation. So let me write that out for you. We'll be left with m squared omega to the power of 4 minus 3km omega squared plus k squared is equal to 0. That's what happens when you plug these guys into here and then divide by the ej omega t. Now, what's interesting about this is this means we can solve this using the quadratic formula to find four distinct values of omega. And I won't go through the maths, but if you did apply the quadratic formula, which I think we all know, omega 1 will be equal to 0 0.618 times the square root of k on m. Omega 2, another root, will be 1.618 times the square root of k on m. We will have a third root, which I'll just call omega-3 for now, which will be minus of this value. It'll be minus 0 0.618 times the square root of k on m. And you will have a fourth root, which will be minus 1.618 times the square root of k on m just there. And so we've got four roots for omega. And so what this means is if we apply, apply superposition, that means we can generate a generalized equation for x1. So we know that x1, after applying the superposition theorem, it's going to be um, some constant a, potentially even complex, times e to the j omega 1t, plus another constant times e to the j omega 2t, plus another constant times e to the j omega 3t, plus another constant times e to the j omega 4t. I'm running out of space, but I hope you can see this. And so what this means is this is our generalized expression for x1. But of course, it's not very pretty. Let's see if we can simplify this down a little bit more. We can apply Euler's formula, which states that um, e to the j theta is equal to cosine theta plus j sine theta. And we can substitute this into all of these expressions. And if you go through the maths, and it's not that hard, it just involves a few trigonometry substitutions, you can prove that x1 has the generalized form of another constant, which I'm also going to call a, it's different to this constant, times by cosine omega 1 t minus phi 1 plus b cosine omega 2t minus phi 2. 
And so what's interesting about this expression is it shows that our generalized equation of motion for block one is the summation of two cosine waves, where a phi one and phi two and b are just constants, which of course can be solved from the initial conditions. Now what's also interesting to note is that when you go through the maths um, from substituting from here to here, you'll show that only omega-1 and omega-2 need to show up. Omega-3 and omega-4 don't need to. And in short, that's because um, they can be meshed together with um, trigonometry rules. Um, but what's really interesting about it is it shows that these two things are the frequencies at which x1 oscillates. It oscillates at two frequencies simultaneously in the general case, which is what leaves these guys with the special name of natural frequencies. And so omega-1 and omega-2, which are your positive roots of your characteristic equation, are your natural frequencies. And that's all we care about. Notice that these values we don't care about so much because they mesh together very nicely. All right, now that we've got the expression for x1, what's a quick and easy way we can find the expression for x2? Well, notice we've already got x2 isolated in this expression just here. If we actually plug this value of x1 into this equation just here, then we'll have x2 by itself. And I won't go through the maths, it just involves literally plugging x1 to here and x1 into here and solving the algebra. But if you were to do that, you could show that x2 is going to be equal to 1.618 times by a cosine omega 1t minus phi 1, and this is the same a just here, by the way, minus 0 0.618 times by b, the same b just here, cosine omega 2t minus phi 2, right? And that means then the equation of motion for block two looks very similar to the equation of motion for block one, except for one crucial difference. Their amplitudes here are different. And in fact, these ratios of amplitudes corresponding to different natural frequencies are called your natural modes, or sometimes your mode shapes. So let's actually find this amplitude ratio just here. It's the amplitude of block one divided by the amplitude of block two that corresponds to our first natural frequency, which I will denote with a superscript one. And that's going to be equal to A divided by 1.618A, 1.618A. And notice it doesn't actually matter what the value of A is because it cancels out. And you can tell this will be 0 0.618. So this is the amplitude ratio of our first block to our second block corresponding to our first natural frequency. Now let's do the same for our other mode. It will be a1 divided by a2 with a superscript of 2 because we're corresponding it with the second natural frequency and that will be b divided by this guy. It'll be b divided by minus 0.618b Notice the b's cancel off, and you're left with minus 1.618 like this. And so there we have it. We have both of our natural modes, we have both of our natural frequencies, and we have our equation of motion for both of our blocks just here. And to make this really clear for you, I'm even going to write this in. These are your natural modes, or sometimes called mode shapes, here and here. There we go. I hope that made sense, guys. Just before I end this video, I just want to mention that solving this problem in this way was the turning point for me in understanding engineering vibrations in a whole lot more light. And I really hope that you had a similar type of experience with this video. Just so you know, I've also got a whole lot more example and proof videos coming up as well. Cheers.